Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure. It's actually a great honor to be selected to give this presentation. I consider it as a celebration for all the great things that you have been presenting today and that you will be uh, presenting uh, tomorrow. Um, there is also one more thing that I would like to do. Um, so giving this lecture, having all these um, presentations that we had, there were some people who worked a lot. So these four people that I would like to mention is Michele De Lorenzi, Maria Grazia Giuffreda, Andreas Fichtner, and Olaf Schenk, who did a tremendous amount of work so that we can all gather together today and, and have this event. So please join me in thanking them for their work. So the title of this presentation, um, the arrow of computational uh, science. Uh, so I think I need to do some explaining about the title of the talk first. So first of all, um, there are some more people that I would like to thank before we go too far. Um, these are people actually starting from far away to getting closer who contributed to this talk. And you will see some of their work uh, as I go along in this uh, presentation. So speaking of arrows, um, these are some of the arrows that I see every day I come to work. And actually, I noticed after selecting this title, there's about 50 arrows that I see uh, every day coming. And these arrows usually point to a certain direction. So you may think that the arrow of computational science is about pointing to a certain uh, direction. So coming from Greece, uh, there's more arrows. So this is the 300, and, and Olaf Schenk told me that you will be 300, and I come from Sparta. So I think it's quite appropriate to show you some of these arrows. And, and as every Swiss kid knows, there is another very, very famous arrow, and that's the arrow of uh, William uh, Tell. So there is arrows in all mythologies and all histories of the different uh, nations. So this is uh, regarding arrows, but actually the place where I took the title is from a beautiful statement that was done by Arthur Eddington, and he was actually talking about the arrow of time, and he was actually trying to talk about the physics concept, perhaps, if you want to see it, is the concept of entropy, where you look at an arrow, and if you see more random elements, this points towards the future, and if you see less, this points towards the past. And I find the beautiful relationships between this arrow and every frame that you will see in the following simulations, because every time you will see a frame of a simulation. It contains, actually, the future, and the future is going to play later. So it's actually as building a memory of the past. So I thought the arrow of computational science is relevant to Arthur's Eddington arrow of time. Now, the more difficult part is about computational science. So what is computational science? So I think this is an appropriate picture to describe the situation that we have in computational science. So in a sense, it depends on who you ask, and it depends on what side of science this person is looking at. And you have to imagine that these people are blind and they don't talk to each other. So sometimes computational science may seem like that. And actually, I would like to argue that computational science is exactly the opposite. It's actually now people coming together, having open eyes, talking to each other the language of computation. And I think we have a chance to describe fully and completely elephants. So, um, computing. So, computing is considered today the third pillar of scientific inquiry. And, of course, from centuries, we have been having to our disposal observations, and we have been using observations and simple experimentations. And, of course, all Greeks are famous for theory. So, these are, have been standard elements of, of our inquiry into science, into understanding our world. So the new thing, and I would like to argue it's a new thing that offers complementary um, uh, traits to, to what observations and theory present, is, is computing. So computing relies, of course, in computers, and computers is one of the most disruptive technologies of our century and perhaps of the history of mankind. And I just chose one particular instant where mankind was actually defeated by a computer. This is the time that Garry Kasparov was beaten by the deep blue, and you can see the faces of the people, and you can see the face of Kasparov. Perhaps this was the time that ushered uh, computers and computer science to the mainstream. Now, there is a, a new and interesting detail. The date that you see there, it was because it was discovered that actually deep blue beat Kasparov because of a bug. 
According to the engineers of IBM, at some point, there was a, a, moment, a moment in the program where the program didn't know what move to make, so it chose one in random, and apparently this was a brilliant move that, <laughs> that baffled uh, Kasparov. So um, now, um, to introduce computational science, I think I would rely on, on something, I would rely on paradigms. I think instead of telling you it's this and that, and, and it does this and that, I would like to show you some paradigms. There, there are a few paradigms. I was actually very surprised. I reached out to many colleagues, and they were all very willing to, to show me the great stuff that they do. So I apologize if not all of their work is shown uh, here. But what I consider a paradigm is a distinct concept or a thought pattern. So I would like to show you some of these paradigms of computational science, and perhaps we can try to understand what computational science is all about. So the first paradigm belongs to uh, Michele Parinello um, from ETH and Uzi. And what Michele sent me is an animation that he has done by doing his beautiful methods, his molecular mechanics and quantum mechanics, where you see a protein. And then what Michele is presenting here, he's presenting this little red blue thing. And this little red th blue thing is, is a drug. And the idea is that you can run a simulation and try to see if different drugs, if different molecules are able to arrive at the enzymatic center of the protein and disabled, in particular case, because this protein probably is, is malicious. So this is something that you can do. You can contribute to drug design by performing computations, and it would be difficult to do any experiment or any simulation. This is another simulation by George Kanyadakis from Brown University. Uh, this is uh, a patient-specific um, uh, vasculature that includes an aneurysm. And it's actually one of the first simulations that was done on a grid. And what uh, George has done and his co-workers, they performed the simulation of the blood flow, and then they switched from doing macro-scale simulations of the blood flow to looking at the behavior of the platelets at the end of the aneurysm. Then these platelets, eventually, they become triggered. They start to become chemically active. They start to adhere to each other, and, and that's perhaps one of the onset of thrombosis that is associated uh, with aneurysms. Another example of computational science comes from uh, uh, another domain, and this is a domain of biology, and this is imaging. What you see here, this is work of Ivo Spalzarini, actually, uh, where he was actually um, locating and tracking viruses. Now, of course, you can see all these viruses being tracked in an automated fashion, and the colors that you see there, they actually correspond to classification of the different motions that the viruses did. The motivation for this project was a collaboration with Ari Helenius and Urs Kroeber from ETH and University of Zurich, which actually, about 15 years ago, they were doing um, PhD thesis, and each PhD thesis will contain four trajectories because the biologist would compute these trajectories one point by hand and write down the centimeters and then go and plot. And what Evo did is to give them an automated tool. So now theses in biology are done with thousands and millions of such trajectories, and these trajectories, they actually can give you statistical, um, uh, being statistical meaningful. Another thing we do, we can look actually at other things. There is things like wound healing assays, and we can actually perform computing so that we can track individual cells. And this wound healing assays is actually the bread and butter of biologists who are interested to see how cells are moving. So we develop software with them, and, and we develop software not only that it tries to be correct and to actually track all these different wound healing assays, but what's important for biology is that the software has user interfaces and it's usable so that they can actually do and probe it and do all sorts of studies uh, that they can do in biology. Staying in biology, um, there is another uh, uh, project that I find quite fascinating. This is a project by Michael Sachs from UT Austin, and Michael Sachs is looking into mitral valves. And what people realize in mitral valves is that when you do an operation, uh, it's, not, it's very important to know the detailed stress distribution in these mitral uh, valves. So what uh, Michael Sachs did, he was able to do, go and do actually imaging, and he's using special techniques where he can actually not only reconstruct the shape of the particular valve, but also look at the orientation of these fibers, incorporate the orientation of the fibers into the stress-strain relationships of his finite element codes, and then he, what he's able to do now, he's able to perform uh, simulations of, of mitral valves, 
And these mitral valves, actually, you can go now to the computer, and if you're a surgeon, you can, you can perturb and you can operate, and then the program will tell you what's going to happen to the strains or what's going to happen to the stresses that will be experienced by this mitral valve after you do an operation. Now, um, again, the next example is again in biology, but in a different scale, and it's about computing behavior, and that's something that experiments cannot do again. So the behavior that we're going to be computing is this behavior here. It's about hunting behavior. And what you see is a, is a fish there, and the hero is the little fish that you try to catch, he tries to catch. And there is a, a close-up of this, of this fish, so you can see what's really happening. So he's trying to suck him in. And then this guy is bending his body, and he's able to escape. So this pattern of escape, this pattern of escape is something that biologists know quite well. It's called the sea start. And then that's whenever a little animal is disturbed, it bends its body into a sea, is using its tail to move some vortices, and then it escapes. So the question we asked is, we don't want to just take the images and repeat what nature does. We wanted to ask, is this optimal? Is, is nature optimal? We always say nature does wonderful things, but let's examine if nature does wonderful things. So what we did is we took a, a zebra fish and we created an anatomically correct zebra uh, fish. Well, not 100%. But nevertheless, we gave it the shape of a zebra fish, and then we gave it degrees of freedom and parameters that an algorithm would optimize. And these parameters had to be selected so that over a certain small amount of time, the fish would have to go to the biggest distance. So again, computing, we actually chose an algorithm that comes from biology, and it's the algorithm of evolution. So we take this idea of evolution, and instead of having genes, we have parameters that we use, and we map them into genes, and then we use ideas similar to what evolution is using, and we try now to use evolution in the computer. So we evolve now our zebra fish, and I will show you the final outcome of the zebra fish that we had. So we found this is actually the optimal behavior and the best behavior that a fish can do, and you see all these vortices that this guy is doing. This is hundreds of thousands of hours in CSES, and it's actually probably the only place that would give us so much time to do great things uh, like this. So the difference with experiments is that you actually can go and, and, and you see that when you look at the center line of the fish here, what you get from experiments, and you look into 3D simulations, you see that the stroke that you get out of the optimization is very similar to what you observe in nature, but the extra thing is that you understand. So simulations let you understand, and what the simulations tell us basically here is that what this guy does is he is very fable. He doesn't have a very strong tail, so he's bending his body and he's trapping the fluid, and then he's pushing the fluid away, and with a very elegant motion of his tail, he's creating vorticity that takes the fluid away. And we can do this because we have the data and we can play back the data and see where the flow came from or when we look back at the vorticity of the flow. So uh, we can explain, and then of course, once we have ground our teeth on fish, we can take the algorithm that we are using and go actually now to a real engine. So this is a test rig that was done together with Alstom where we had uh, fuel injectors, and, and we had this fuel injector that you see here. And what we did, there were parameters. The parameters were the fuel injection rates that you give to this injector. So what we did in order to decide how much fuel should be given along uh, these injectors, we used an optimization algorithm. There is no simulation now. This is a computation that's done together with an experiment and optimizing the experiment. And experiments are noisy, but we had to come up with algorithms that they can do um, noisy optimization. And we did this Pareto front that we try to minimize the emissions and we try to minimize the pulsation. So the results, this is the schedule that you have to have for the different uh, valves. So these are six valves. And what you see here is the fuel injection rate. So if you want to have high uh, emissions but you want to have low pulsation, that's how you should be developing, uh, that's what be the flow rate for the valves. And if you want to do the opposite, a more uniform distribution is appropriate. Now, so that you understand what's happened is that the operation conditions or the conditions engineers had done so far, 
for this turbine was just a single point, and they were not really sure how to move around and find out what should be the other parameters. And this is all done in an automated fashion, and this is what uh, computing can do actually together uh, with real devices. Now, moving up in scale, um, there's more things that computing can do. Uh, so this is an example from Fotis Sotiropoulos from the University of Minnesota. Uh, what Fotis is interested in is he's trying to restore rivers and, and streams. And the story here is um, this is a, an anatomically correct river in the sense that they have collected the depth distribution of the river. And the interest here is that once these rivers are going through fields, there is a lot of fertilizers that are being fallen into the river. And once these fertilizers are falling into the river, they can be polluting. But there is a way that can uh, work around that. And the way around that is that there is anaerobic bacteria and they can take uh, the nitrate from the fertilizers and then um, and inhalate it. And, and the way they do that is they need a long residence time of these um, fertilizers so they can operate on it. So what people do is they go and they put wooden dumps, they drop wood into the rivers so that the flow can stay there and recirculate. So what you can do with the simulations of Sotiropoulos is you can have a river, you can distribute pollutants, and then you can decide strategically where you should be placing these woods so that the uh, flow can recirculate. And the more recirculation you have, again, the more and the better it is for the bacteria to take and to remove all these pollutants uh, from the river. So this complete process is what is being shown in this simulation by Sotiropoulos and his group at the University of Minnesota. And now um, we move to another place, uh, and we move to one of my most favorite places on Earth. This is Tokyo. And in Tokyo, um, people are very much concerned about pollution. And, and so what Takayuki Aoki and his group are doing, they're using 4,000 GPUs to do the simulation around all the buildings of Tokyo. They have been able to reconstruct the whole city. And you can actually play the simulation and go and look and what happened in Shinjuku and Shinagawa and Ginza and whatever place you'd like to go. So this is another, I believe, amazing simulation that would be difficult to study, and actually they use it for architectural uh, planning. So moving on and going out of the Earth now, and we're going now to space, or trying to go to space, and there is the story of scramjets, and this is the story or the idea of trying to get access to space, or even more, create commercial planes that they will do Zurich to Sydney in two hours. The idea here is that you have um, aircraft that they don't have any more turbines or moving parts, but then combustion happens because the aircraft is moving at a very, very high speed, and then the air goes into the combustor, and then after it combusts, then the air and the exhaust that they go out of the aircraft, that's what's actually propelling the aircraft that you saw here. Here was the disengagement. So this idea of the scramjets, the movie that you just see, it happened in the 1950s. Over the last 50 or 60 years, there's been more and more work, and there seems to be some more uh, new exciting work that's happening between NASDAQ, the University of Queensland, and the Center for Turbulence Research. And what these people are doing is they're having this high sought to target experiment. Now, you have to understand that these are very expensive experiments. You can do only six or seven of them, and, and you cannot get a lot of quantitative details about what's really happening in there. So this is actually where high fidelity detailed simulations are coming into place to try to mitigate the cost of these experiments. And this is actually, I will let you see it. And in the honor of the, me being a DJ when I was at Stanford, this has music. That's what you do when you work late. So there's different aspects of the Scramjet, and you will see some of those. So this allows you to have access to the interaction of the supersonic sock with the boundary layer and to try to decide what should you do about your surfaces, you try to understand and to control. But then the next and most interesting thing is the combustion. What you see here in the combustor, you see this area of dark, which is this low temperature. You observe this lifting 
flames and you can do all these things that like Sliren that people would do in an experiment. And then you are able, of course, to control, to understand and to have full quantitative information through detailed simulation. So, uh, and last, after we have reached space, of course, what is left? As you may understand, what is left is the universe. So what is going to be next is a simulation of the universe. Every little dot that you would see corresponds to thousands of planets, if not galaxies. And this is a simulation. This is called the Millennium Simulation that was done at Garching. And I will let you again enjoy this simulation as well. of not millions of hours, it used billions of computational elements and people are using access to these simulations in the place that there is never going to be ever the chance to perform an experiment or to do a theory. So um, what is it that computational scientists do? So let's move away from the paradigms. I hope you have seen some examples of achievements in computational science. So what is it that we do and what are the questions that we try to address? So usually what we have is we have a certain science and then out of the science together with application specific people, we do model development. There is development based on theory and data, more later on that. And then we go actually and we corrupt in a sense the, the principles that we got and the equations and we put them into numerics. And then once you do this corruption, there's two things that you have to do. You have to combine computer science with mathematics and then you have to perform things like validation and verification. You have to interact with experiments. And you have to worry basically about three questions. So the three questions that we are trying to address is are we solving the equations right? And this is the story of verification. Are we solving relevant equations? This is the story of validation. And finally, very important, are we doing enough science for all the millions that we get and all these beautiful machines that we have? And once the answer to all these things is yes, then we are good. And then what we have is we have more trouble because we have on one hand a tool for scientific discovery, but then we have also data and more data. But then we have to worry about issues uh, like that as well. So what are the three challenges of a computational scientist? I'll try to present them from my perspective into three. The first one is the gap that I will discuss in a second. The second one is data. And today it's uh, more fashionable to say big data. And finally, uh, look towards the future of computational science. I'll be talking about systems. So the first one is the gap. So what is the gap? Uh, the gap is the gap between hardware and software. And the winner here is hardware because computer scientists, they're doing some amazing work. And they're able to give us more and more capacity and better and better performance, better gigaflops, better petaflops. And on the other hand, if you look at the community from where I'm coming from, from fluid dynamics, we don't really harness all these capabilities that the computers are giving us. And in fact, if you look at back at some of the codes that I just showed you, and if you look at codes that are developed by uh, national centers in the US, they actually are able to get almost 10% of not less of the peak performance of the machines. So this big gap, this is something that we try to address in my lab. And of course, we are not a national lab. And that's actually only two or three people who were working on this particular gap. So I'm going to tell you the story of how we try to close the gap, in particular for the case of flow simulations. So closing this gap, given that all these people have not done it, actually, I, people compared it with something uh, that people say and call it a moonshot. A moonshot is trying to reach the moon. You have one chance to do that. And I will tell you more why we had only one chance. But it's something that you have to dream about. So here is a little video that describes better than me what is a moonshot. The 
actual moonshot is wonderful, inspirational, poetic, beautiful, involved, great technical challenges, genuine heroism. It brought the world together. But think about the Polynesian Islander on the dugout canoe, deciding one day they were going to go that way. No one had ever been that way before. No one even knew if there was anything that way before. It was amazing, and it changed the world. We did not change the world but we tried to close the gap. <laughs> so, and in this Polynesian canoe, there, were, uh, uh, there was actually what was Polynesia. Polynesia was actually going for the Gordon Bell Prize. So this is the story of the Gordon Bell Prize. But uh, I think you need to know who was in this canoe. So this is some of the people who were in the canoe. And there were a few more people, uh, including all the people in Lawrence Livermore who helped us to materialize this. But the truth is, and I want you to know, is that there were basically three people and that's actually why just a few people can actually do all these magnificent things. And, and why we got what we got is because of Diego, Babak, and, and, and Panos. And actually, they were the three who were much more convinced than me that we can actually uh, close the gap. So what was the story? So what is it that we did? Um, so we were interested in developing a code. We started with compressible flows, so we don't have to worry about the Poisson equation. So the first thing we did is we wanted to study shock bubble interaction. So this was a study of shock bubble interaction. We were able to run uh, basically at CSCS 40,000 cores, 250 billion particles, and it's about 35% of the peak. So this was results that we presented in supercomputing 12. Um, again, and this is some of the elements that went into uh, building this code. You have to understand that Diego is a computer scientist who led fluid mechanics and partial differential equations. Babak was an experimental fluid mechanician who learned computer science, and, and Panos was a computer scientist who stayed computer scientist. But it was thanks to this team that we were actually able to perform the simulations. Again, only 30% of the peak. But then all this story here was already involved in, in what we were trying to achieve. So the next stage was actually to go and to do this bigger and better, and that's when we got hit by this news that in January 2013, actually a few months before we were able to submit, Stanford was first to actually break the barrier of one million cores, and I will show you what they were able to simulate. They were able to simulate exhaust noise from a jet with a corrugated exit, and, and they were able to use billions or trillions of computational elements, and one more thing, they had access to Sequoia, which was the biggest machine that you could have in the US. On the other side, we had no access to Sequoia. In fact, we didn't have a little access to any machine that was big enough to try for the Gordon Bell. So what I did is to go around and to try to beg people to give us some time. And then the people at IBM talked to people in, in Ulich, and the people in Ulich talked to people in, in, in Lawrence Livermore, and they gave us about 20, 25 hours of time when the machine was down. And the idea was that we will go and we will give with a stick our code to IBM. IBM will send it to the people in, in, in Livermore, and the people in Livermore will press the button. There was no time for us to debug, nothing to do. And not only that, actually five hours after we were doing our runs, the people called back to IBM, to us, and then they said, your code doesn't run. It just hangs somewhere. So we had just 15 hours and only a, a screenshot to understand what was going wrong. And that was actually the time that Diego said, we're going to win this thing. And indeed, uh, they were able to find out what was the bug. It was just a print statement that was different, the code run. And then um, what is the problem that we studied? We studied bubbles. We had to choose what problem we start because we didn't have enough time. So what are bubbles? Bubbles is something that you have seen a lot. This is credit to my wife. And, and that's actually you're boiling some water. Therefore, the temperature increases. You get some bubbles. But you can get also bubbles in another way by going orthogonal to the other, and that is by reducing pressure. If you are an engineer, you know that pressure goes down when velocity goes up. Velocity goes up, pressure goes down. This is Bernoulli, and then you get these bubbles. And then the bubbles, they move on, and they move to another place of the flow, and then they collapse. And when bubbles collapse, they are very catastrophic, as this beautiful experiment will show you. You shake a bottle, you create bubbles, and then you send a shock down, and then the shock, as it goes down, is able to destroy the back of the bottle. This is something for after this talk, for outside. <laughs> so, 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 but, but if we, we can see this, this thing actually in slow motion, so you can be sure you do it right. 
Now, this, this cavitation story is, is very important, not only in parties, but also if you look at propellers, if you look at, the, uh, at all sorts of turbo machinery. This is the Hoover Dam. This is cavitation in the Hoover Dam. And there was actually the outflow. And what you see here is a human. This is the size of the pipes. And this is damage due to cavitation. But cavitation also is something that people can use. And, and people use it in order to induce bubbles in the areas near tumors. And then by doing ultrasound, they induce cavitation. And then they're able to deliver drugs much further than they could deliver without inducing cavitation. Now, the, stereo, the story of, of, of cavitation is that being such a destructive thing, it's very difficult to perform experiments, except at looking at after the fact type of numbers, how many holes do I have, did this thing break type of thing. And on the other hand, the theory and the modeling, they basically have been limited to a large part, to single bubbles, two dimensions, ordinary differential equations, nowhere near having many, many bubbles that you could do such uh, simulations. So the state of the art was actually a guy that joined us in our effort. This is 120 bubbles under resolving a coarse graining. So we took the equations, and in fact, we didn't do anything fancy. We just took the classical equations that people use. This is an implementation of window schemes in compressible multi-component flows. Uh, we had large jumps in quantities that we have to observe because of the liquid and, and, and the vapor. And then we took this equation and we discretized them uh, with the finite volume method. So the finite volume method is the bread and butter of people who do CFD. You can see it from places that they do climate modeling to scramjets to fish to lava eruptions to anything you want. is like a, a fluid mechanics, computation of fluid mechanics one or one. So now, what is it that we did to this, um, um, to this finite volume? And this is where a lot of computer science came from Diego and Panos. And the idea was that we will perform our design based on the roofline model. So the idea of the roofline model is that if you look at the flops that you get, you can distinguish them into two parts. This is bytes per second. This is your access to memory. And this is flops per byte. This is what you can get from your code. So if you have a computer, um, you can look at the gigaflops, and you can do micro benchmarks, and you can get the, the line that would give you the gigaflops, and that should be the ceiling of what you would expect, except since you have to have memory access, then you are limited by access to memory. And if you put these two numbers together, this is where you get this roofline model. Now, depending on what is your operational intensity, if you are to the right, then you have the full access to the capabilities of the machine. If you are to the left, you don't. You are memory bound. And the bad news for, for fluids people is that actually most of the case is that we are indeed memory bound. And this is the reason why people have not been able to get more than 10% because of this locality that we have in our structure grids. And this is why things like molecular dynamics or other particle methods, they are better off. This is an example of this arithmetic intensity here, right? This three accesses to memory and two operations that I do here. This is this arithmetic intensity that I'm talking about. So what Diego, Panos, and, and, and others, and Babak, and Costas, and Alessandro did is to work on all these things. And I will not tell you all these details of what they accomplished. But the long story short is by not changing the computational complexity of the algorithm, but using basically every trick of the book and exploiting all the things that you can do in writing code and taking care of the architecture of the computer, they were able to move this. And they were able to move this, and the operational intensity from being memory bound was actually moved to being um, compute bound. And that's actually what gave us um, the capabilities to perform this simulation. Actually, besides uh, doing petaflops, the most important thing is doing the results very fast. And there is a way that you can normalize your time to solution. You look at the wall clock time, you look at the number of cores that you have, and you look at the number of points that you're using the simulation. And that's actually how we uh, compared our results with the people from Munich and Stanford. The people in Munich never run in the Sequoia, so we gave them the benefit of the doubt that they scale perfectly there. The people in Stanford did run on Sequoia, and they reported their numbers. This is what we achieved, uh, which is 72% of peak, which is closing the gap. We were able to run with 13 trillion computational elements. This is running the capability of 15,000 bubbles with about 100 points across each one of the bubble. 
And there was actually a very uh, nice and unique scheme about the compression of the data, because once you start to go to 13 trillion points, you have to worry about what you do with your data. So here are some of the simulations. Um, this is actually simulations done at CSCS. They were not the simulations done in Sequoia. So you see less points. And what you observe, you observe the bubbles. You observe that they don't remain axisymmetric. You observe actually this pressure peak, which is the yellow that is appearing in the center and actually gives you a 10 or 50 or 100 fold um, increase in the pressure. And here's another one, a more slow motion of this process. You can see that now you can go back and come up with new theories because you realize that in this case of, of the cavitation collapse, the idea of axisymmetry may not be valid, at least on the outside of the cloud. They may be valid in the interior of the cloud. But again, uh, what we need to do is to get access to more time and to be able to run the code to actually uh, be able to study uh, such uh, <coughs> phenomena. Now, um, so I think we have closed the gap. And I, and I think we are not the only ones, because I think our colleagues from UT Austin, Bob Moser, and our colleagues from Stanford are actually making moves in that direction. And I will not be surprised that there will be even better ones in the following uh, years. So the next challenge is data. And, and here is a few stories about data here. So data is something that we always had. We always had data because we always had observations about our world. And the other thing we always had is we always had first principles. And, and, and I used Isaac Newton because it was the first time that mechanics went away from the Greek philosophers and started putting rational ways of doing mechanics. So Newton was one of the first who put it. And, and I guess what we have now today is we have data. And there is, of course, a, a situation uh, between the two. So I have a story to tell you how I perceive data and what is something that has stayed in my memory about what is data. So this is my daughter uh, a few years back. And actually, you can see she's not doing very well. So we thought, actually, it's important that we train her. So whenever I would show her a tree like this, it's actually a true story. I took an orange, and I asked her, if I have this orange, where would this orange go if I let it? And of course, I was expecting a new Newton, but nothing like that came about. But she actually pointed me and she said, it's going to go down. And I said, why would the orange will go down? And then actually she pointed me to the floor and she says, because all the other oranges are down there. <laughs> so this is, for me, the example of what is data. And, and, and of course, uh, what we need to do today is to put the two things together. And, and to try to come up with, with better answers. And, and there are people who do that. So this is an example of people that are actually trying to use the technologies that we have from satellites. So there is Again, this, in uh, the idea of doing heat. clouds and climates and, and, and looking at uh, over the temperature miles. over the oceans. And you see the temperature over the oceans and then what's happening at a later time. This is data from satellites, and then what's happening is that you get clouds. And, and as Tapio Snyder, uh, who is here from uh, ETH, uh, my colleague, he tells me, uh, using clouds actually is one of the most challenging thing uh, to capture in, in climate models. And in fact, the sensitivity of climate models to clouds has been very limited, and in particular because they're not able uh, to model well low clouds. So what Kyle Pressel and Tapio Snyder are doing, they're actually doing data simulation and they're trying to do um, modeling uh, for climate by actually using the data from satellites to do models of, of, of clouds. Um, there is another thing that I would like to show you, and it's time for a quiz, and it's actually to relate data experiments and simulations. What you see here is a flow behind a cylinder. And then the quiz is, which one of the two simulations do you believe is correct? So one on top is the red, two on bottom is the blue. So of course, perhaps you cannot decide, but let me give you some more data. Well, here is experimental data. And you can see clearly that the red simulation is doing a better job than the blue simulation. So the question is, uh, which one of the two simulations is correct? And now here is one more data point, and the one more data point is that uh, simulation number two is using 10 times more computational elements than the simulation number one. So which one of the two uh, simulations would you believe? 
So if you have betted on simulation number two, you have won. And the reason is that the experiments, they had noise, and actually they had vibration in their apparatus. And actually, when people were doing very coarse simulations, they observed also uh, numerical noise. And people commissioned experiments that they were much more careful. And indeed, this is a case where simulation uh, preceded um, the experiment. I think I'm going to skip this particular example. Uh, this is because I want to move on uh, to show you something else. This is about nanotechnology and how, again, experiments there need to be cautiously calibrated um, uh, with experiments. But I want to bring up the statement by Sir Arthur Eddington that, again, not only we should be uh, putting error bars in our simulations, but we should also have the experimentalists provide us with theory with everything they observe. And this is actually the story of uncertainty quantification. And this is the story which actually shows you that when we do our simulations, we have errors. We have many, many errors. We have errors because the data that we get are having errors, and these are observational errors. We have errors when we try to do our validation, and indeed, we have discretization errors, we have modeling errors, and of course, you can expect that how do I put all this thing together and try to exact knowledge and to do decisions. There was a talk today by Omar Gattas, I believe, on these items, and this is borrowed actually from their work. So the idea of scientific reasoning is to actually follow the Bayesian approach, where you don't consider theories to be um, uh, deterministic only, but you consider them to be probabilities that are informed from evidence, that are informed from data. And while there is the place where uncertainty quantification and decision-making come together, this is the initial place of a hurricane, and then you want to make a decision whether you evacuate someone or what do you say to the ships that are going through that, you have big uncertainties about as to what happens to this hurricane. You have measurement uncertainties. This is the story of uncertainties in measuring the speed of light, and you can see that in 1960s we are finally reducing the error bars on that. And this is the story about having design. This is the design of the drug of a certain airfoil, and you can see, you design the airfoil in this Mach number, but then the airfoil operates in other numbers, and then you get completely different uh, behaviors. So we should start to put in error bars, and this is a simulation from our colleagues here at ETH, where they also did shock bubble interaction as we did, but then what they preserve or what they present on top of the mean that we presented you earlier, they present you variants of the density field and this depends on the particular parameters that they had on their simulations. And this is another thing that we did, where we actually look in at parameters on molecular dynamics, and we find that we no longer can pick epsilon to be that and the cutoff to be this, but we have to validate according to data and to look at probability distributions for our parameters and then probability distributions for the predictions um, that we make. So um, I want to give you a summary, perhaps, of what I have shown so far. And I'm using this statement for Thomas Kuhn, the structure of scientific revolutions, because I think computing indeed is a scientific revolution, and it's becoming more and more mature to acquire, actually, this identity. So it's the time that we have lots of problems, and we ask a lot of questions that can no longer be answered by theory and experiments alone. But I think computing is a very potent way and it provides us, provides us with a new set of things that we can do. And I believe we have already moved into the area that we have a paradigm shift into the way humans uh, do their inquiries. So what is next? So what is next? Um, there is a few things that one could wish to study or perhaps could be directions for computational science, if you allow me. So we mentioned earlier about Newton, and we said that Newton brought the end of the ancient way of doing, of doing physics, and, and, and he actually brought it in a very materialistic way. So this is the story of multiscaling and causality, and I'm not going to use a simulation to convey uh, the, the message that I want here, but I want to use a, a perhaps a dubious example, and this is war. So when you have war, you have soldiers, and the soldiers, they are interacting with something called the material and the mechanical, the material being the spheres and the arrows, and the mechanical being actually the soldiers. And this is actually the Newtonian description of the world, that we have the material and the mechanical, and that's where perhaps things are staying. Now, if you go back and look again at the soldiers, you see that these soldiers belong to a bigger 
battle. This is actually one of the last battles Swiss soldiers fought. And, and now we go back and we look at the Aristotelian way of looking at what happens in the world. So there, in addition to the material and the mechanical, uh, you have also have the formal, and the formal are the boundary conditions that you might have that are influencing what happens to the material and the mechanical. And on top of that, after you put together all these formal reasons, outside this, you have the final. And the idea is that as we are looking at individual and small systems, and we start to ask bigger and bigger questions, we start to combine perhaps physics with chemistry, with mathematics, with computer science. So how all these things are interfacing needs some kind of a structure. So this idea of causality and these four ways of describing causality by Aristotle is perhaps one way to look into the future of, of multiscaling. Another thing and another wish of mine is perhaps uh, something that reflects on the identity of the PASC problem, program. Alan Turing, in 1936, he said it's possible to invent a single machine to compute any computable sequence. So if you see today in PASC, we have life sciences, materials, uh, and, 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 and physics, and, and others. And perhaps what we can do today is to replace this statement with this statement. Perhaps it's time that we no longer develop, every one of us, his own Poisson solver. We don't develop our own finite volume solver. Perhaps we can start to share and we can start to act as a community to develop things for the mundane. We don't have to reinvent a wheel for all the time. Probably this is going to take time, but I think it would be very interesting because I think in computational science, it's not only the science and, and the mental thinking and, and the the pleasure of finding things out through computation, but it's also the possibility of achieving things in X. And where I think we should be able to show that computational science is becoming important is by putting X next to energy, to water, poverty, information, and complexity. And perhaps these are problems that us as computational scientists, we should demonstrate to the world that we can actually contribute in solving uh, such problems. That's it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for this uh, fascinating window into computational science. Um, we have a, a few minutes for, for uh, questions or comments uh, anyone might have. Clear. <laughs> Last point. Isn't that the code is an algorithm? So you're looking for the one algorithm to compute any problem. No. Um, it's not going to be one single algorithm, but I'm looking for modules. I'm looking at modules that will take components that I don't need to rediscover. And I should be able to have codes that are components that people should be able to take and plug and play. That's what is the message behind the code. I'm not looking for one code that will solve the climate problem. But all the little components, maybe we should have a depository that people don't focus their time on that, but on putting things together. This interfacing is becoming important, I think. So I agree with that, and that's what we for. I agree. Thanks to you. Yeah. Anyone else? There was one here. No. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Hello. Yep. From your experience, Professor Kamusakos, what do you think is uh, the best way to tackle a problem with computational science? I, I, I'm not and sure. What's the best way to tackle a problem of computational science? Because we see that we have to deal with hardware, we have to deal with mathematics, we have to deal with data. And from your experience, what do you think is the best way to tackle a problem? What is the best way to tackle a problem is the question, and that's a loaded answer, a loaded question. <laughs> and I don't have a good answer. I cannot have a good answer to, to that. Uh, I think the best answer, actually, if you look for the best answer, usually it's problem specific. And, and then you have to talk with domain experts to try to understand the particular problem. But then it's about 
doing the best you can with computer science and mathematics. If I can say one recipe is about perhaps not working only with computer science, not working only with mathematics about problems, but combining the three. And in different percentages, depending on the particular question that you are posing. But I don't think this is a good answer to your question. I don't think I can have a good answer to this question. So the, the Greeks were also great philosophers, so I have a philosophical question. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, do you think uh, that, uh, I mean, computational science can give you uh, very useful answers, but do you think it can give you unexpected uh, discoveries? Uh, like yes. I think it can give you unexpected answers, and that's actually what determines it to be a scientific revolution. I think it's not possible to even expect what's happening inside the combustion chamber of a, of a scramjet. It's not possible to expect the particular form of the cavities that I showed you. It's not possible to expect how a molecule will go to the enzymatic center of a protein and interact with it. So it's, it's answers that you don't know their, their answer a priori. Is it a change of paradigm, or it sort of follows what we already put in as a paradigm? No, I think it's a change in a paradigm. So if you read this book of Thomas Kuhn, actually it answers these questions. So he's actually saying that normal science is nothing but a puzzle. And the idea of a puzzle is you have the pieces there, and eventually there is a way that you find that you put them together, and you have the picture that the puzzle is represents. And that's actually normal science. And the new thing is when you have this paradigm shift where there is no puzzle that you can have a priori. Nobody knows where you can put, for example, uh, turbines, wind turbines, so you can harness the biggest uh, wind. Uh, I can show you examples that we do in fish swimming where I can show you aerodynamic shapes that are completely counterintuitive and unexpected. To, and I can tell you that these have much less drag than any beautiful aerodynamic shape that you could perhaps think that this is what normal science will do. So there is a lot of unexpected results that we get, and I think that's actually what makes computational science a revolution, in my opinion. Yes. If eventually you actually take this behavior and go back and you are able to validate this unexpected behavior by commissioning perhaps new experiments, new devices, new probes into this nature. So you are making materials, you can imagine that you can, not you can imagine, you probably do develop new materials in the computer and you can go to the experimental guy and tell him, put this molecule together, put this molecule together and here is something that you could never imagine before. I think this is indeed very possible, and that's actually what computational science is, is performing. We can go to social sciences. There's people who are doing agent-based models, and they try to understand what future things would look like. I think there, again, you have a lot of emergent behavior, and you can also, hopefully, time will validate predictions that you could make. So I think we are going in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Last question? No? Well, let's thank the speaker once again. Sure. There is another very, very famous arrow, and that's the arrow of uh, William uh, Tell. So there is arrows in all mythologies and all histories of the different uh, nations. So this is uh, regarding arrows, but actually the place where I took the title is from a beautiful statement that was done by Arthur Eddington, and he was actually talking about the arrow of time, and he was actually trying to talk about the physics concept, perhaps, if you want to see it, is the concept of entropy, 
where you look at an arrow, and if you see more random elements, this points towards the future, and if you see less, this points towards the past. And I find the beautiful relationships between this arrow and every frame that you will see in the following simulations, because every time you will see a frame of a simulation, it contains actually the future, and the future is going to play later. So it's actually as building a memory of the past. So I thought the arrow of computational science is relevant to Arthur's Eddington arrow of time. Now, the more difficult part is about computational science. So what is computational science? So I think this is an appropriate picture to describe the situation that we have in computational science. So in a sense, it depends on who you ask, and it depends on what side of science this person is looking at. And you have to imagine that these people are blind and they don't talk to each other. So sometimes computational science may seem like that. And actually, I would like to argue that computational science is exactly the opposite. It's actually now people coming together, having open eyes, talking to each other the language of computation. And I think we have a chance to describe fully and completely elephants. So um, computing. So computing is considered today the third pillar of scientific inquiry. And of course, from centuries, we have been having to our disposal obligation of the different motions that the viruses did. The motivation for this project was a collaboration with Ari Helenius and Urs Kroeber from ETH and University of Zurich, which actually about 15 years ago, they were doing um, PhD thesis, and each PhD thesis will contain four trajectories because the biologist would compute these trajectories one point by hand and write down the centimeters and then go and plot. And what Evo did is to give them an automated tool so now theses in biology are done with thousands and millions of such trajectories, and these trajectories, they actually can give you statistical, um, uh, being statistical meaningful. Another thing we do, we can look actually at other things. There is things like wound healing assays, and we can actually perform computing so that we can track individual cells. And these wound healing assays is actually the bread and butter of biologists who are interested to see how cells are moving. So we develop software with them, and, and we develop software not only that it tries to be correct and to actually track all these different wound healing assays, but what's important for biology is that the software has user interfaces and it's usable so that they can actually do and probe it and do all sorts of studies um, that they can do in biology. Staying in biology, um, there is another uh, uh, project that I find quite fascinating. This is a project by Michael Sachs from UT Austin, and Michael Sachs is looking into mitral valves. And what people realize in mitral valves is that when you do an operation, uh, it's, not, it's very important to know the detailed stress distribution in these mitral uh, valves. So what uh, Michael Sachs did, he was able to do, go and do actually imaging, and he's using special techniques where he can actually not only reconstruct the shape of the particular valve, but also look at the orientation of these fibers, incorporate observations, and we have been using observations and simple experimentations. And of course, all Greeks are famous for theory, so these are, have been standard elements of, of our inquiry into science, into understanding our world. So the new thing, and I would like to argue it's a new thing that offers complementary um, uh, traits to, to what observations and theory present is, is computing. So computing relies, of course, in computers, and computers is one of the most disruptive technologies of our century and perhaps of the history of mankind. And I just chose one particular instant where mankind was actually defeated by a computer. This is the time that Garry Kasparov was beaten by the deep blue, and you can see the faces of the people, and you can see the face of Kasparov. Perhaps this was the time that ushered uh, computers and computer science to the mainstream. Now, there is a, a new and interesting detail. The date that you see there, it was because it was discovered that actually deep blue beat Kasparov because of a bug. According to the engineers of IBM, at some point, there was a, a, moment, a moment in the program where the program didn't know what move to make, so it chose one in random, and apparently this was a brilliant move that, <laughs> that baffled uh, Kasparov. So um, now, um, to introduce computational science, I think I would uh, rely on, on something, I would rely on paradigms. I think instead of telling you it's this and that, and, and it does this and that, I would like to show you some paradigms. There are, there are a few paradigms 
I was actually very surprised. I reached out to many colleagues and they were all very willing to, to show me the great stuff that they do. So I apologize if not all of their work is shown uh, here. But what I consider a paradigm is a distinct concept or a thought pattern. So I would like to show you some of these paradigms of computational science and perhaps we can try to understand. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure. It's actually a great honor to be selected to give this presentation. I consider it as a celebration for all the great things that you have been presenting today and that you will be uh, presenting uh, tomorrow. Um, there is also one more thing that I would like to do. Um, so, given this lecture, having all these um, presentations that we had, there were some people who worked a lot. So, these four people that I would like to mention is Michele De Lorenci, Maria Grazia Giuffreda, Andreas Fichtner, and Olaf Schenk, who did a tremendous amount of work so that we can all gather together today and, and have this event. So, please join me in thanking them for their work. So the title of this presentation, um, The Arrow of Computational uh, Science, uh, so I think I need to do some explaining about the title of the talk first. So first of all, um, there are some more people that I would like to thank before we go too far. Um, these are people actually starting from far away to getting closer who contributed to this talk, and you will see some of their work uh, as I go along in this uh, presentation. So speaking of arrows, uh, these are some of the arrows that I see every day I come to work. And actually, I noticed after selecting this title, there's about 50 arrows that I see uh, every day coming. And these arrows usually point to a certain direction. So you may think that the arrow of computational science is about pointing to a certain uh, direction. So coming from Greece, uh, there's more arrows. So this is the 300. And, and Olaf Schenk told me that you will be 300, and I come from Sparta. So I think it's quite appropriate to show you some of these arrows. And, and as every Swiss kid knows, and what computational science is all about. So the first paradigm belongs to uh, Michele Parinello uh, from ETH and Uzi. And what Michele sent me is an animation that he has done by doing his beautiful methods, his molecular mechanics and quantum mechanics, where you see a protein, and then what Michele is presenting here, he's presenting this little red blue thing, and this little red th blue thing is, is a drug. And the idea is that you can run a simulation and try to see if different drugs, if different molecules are able to arrive at the enzymatic center of the protein and disabled, in particular case, because this protein probably is, is malicious. So this is something that you can do. You can contribute to drug design by performing computations, and it would be difficult to do any experiment or any simulation. This is another simulation by George Kanyadakis from Brown University. Uh, this is uh, a patient-specific um, uh, vasculature that includes an aneurysm. And it's actually one of the first simulations that was done on a grid. And what uh, George has done and his co-workers, they performed the simulation of the blood flow, and then they switched from doing macro-scale simulations of the blood flow to looking at the behavior of the platelets at the end of the aneurysm, then these platelets eventually they become triggered, they start to become chemically active, they start to adhere to each other, and, and that's perhaps one of the onset of thrombosis that is associated uh, with aneurysms. Another example of computational science comes from uh, uh, another domain, and this is a domain of biology, and this is imaging. What you see here, this is work of Ivo Spalzarini, actually, uh, where he was actually um, locating and tracking viruses. Now, of course, you can see all these viruses being tracked in an automated fashion, and the colors that you see there, they actually correspond to classification.